It is good to see y'all. 
Good to see y'all online. Thank y'all for joining us. We are back. We are back for another edition of Dive. This one is going to be a, a special one. Um, this is going to be a different take, so to speak. I know we've been doing our Cash App series, but I just wanted to take a moment just to share how God is kind of impressing things in my heart. And so today's basic understanding or today's framework for how we're going to lead off is going to be around how do we handle fear? How do we handle distractions? How do we handle when we get knocked down? How do we handle the setbacks in our lives? Because there's a lot of things that are happening in society that come to try to take away our ability to want to move forward or, or even be productive. Um, just, you know, plainly looking at the news, seeing what happened with Jacob um, in Wisconsin was just very shocking. Um, officers show up on the scene and within seconds, this man is getting shot in his back seven times, but thanks be to God that he survived all that happened in that ordeal and, and definitely I, ho I hope him a, a speedy recovery. So with that being said, we are gonna shift gears. I'm gonna pray us in. And as we're going along, just feel free to shoot your questions in so that way we have them. And I'll make sure to try to get through as many questions as we can in the time that we have allotted. So with that being said, let me go ahead and pray us in. Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity just to serve you with our talents, our abilities, but most importantly, we thank you for the resources that you've given us, God, both financially as well as just spiritually, God, to uplift our souls, to give us joy, to give us peace, and just to give us physical activities of our limbs, God, because we know that these are gifts that come from you because you bring life in that more abundantly. So I pray that you would dwell in this space, that you would guide our thoughts, our actions, but most importantly, I pray that we would leave changed with a closer connection unto you. And we pray this in everything, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, y'all. So as we kick off this session, I, I wanna start us off with a question. So I want our, our chat host to add this question to our group um, or in our, our chat platforms. And basically that question is, what do you fear most? What do you fear most? And this, this is going to kind of help give us a, a little bit of a launch pad for today's discussion. Because like I said, it's, it's rehab. How do you overcome what you're facing? How do you get past the setbacks that you're feeling? But I think a lot of it kind of starts out with that most basic level of, of fear of, hey, I want to, but, or if I try it, it may not go the way I want to. So let me research it a little bit more. Or I tried it and it just didn't go well. So you know what? I'm, I'm fearful of even trying it again because I don't know what's going to happen. So I just want to hear from you guys in the chat. Just drop in. What do you fear most? Share your ideas in the chat with, with folks that you have there. And hopefully we have some, some good ideas, some good things flowing in on what do you fear most? And in that same token, I know for me, one of the things that I fear most is going to be um, not living up to the potential uh, that God has for me, as well as others that I, I respect, um, because there's a lot of different things that are thrown at me. And so in the back of my mind, I'm always fearful of, is that decision the right decision that I should make in that time? Should I take this job opportunity? Should I do this thing with my time? Should I not do this thing and so for me it gets to that analysis paralysis of hey i want to but i'm, I'm not sure how it's going to go so let me go back to my comfort zone which is researching a little bit more before i make that decision and so for me the thing that i fear most is just that that the unknown of hey if i do this what am i giving up or what am i not going to be able to accomplish and i and i feel like that kind of cripples me because I'm, I'm looking at the potential situation, but it, you know, the potential is always going to be there. It's just, what am I actualizing? What am I closing that gap in? Because there's a space in between, you know, that potential that you have and where you really are. And the only way you close that gap is by doing. And so for me, I've come to that realization that I'm only going to close that gap of my potential by accomplishing, by doing those things 
that God has called me to do. And I trust that he'll speak to me through his word, through prayer and through sound and wise counsel that I surround myself with. So that's what I wanted to kick us off with. So that way you guys could start to think about, okay, what is it that I fear? What is it that God is calling me to do in this season? Um, whether it be write that book or whether it be, you know what, I might need to turn in my resignation notice because I'm comfortable in starting this new business. I have enough to sustain me until I can get this thing fully off the ground, but I know it's gonna require my time and my efforts at this time. So we're gonna spend some time diving into that. So let's go ahead and move forward. So I titled it Rehab and you're probably thinking, okay, I, I see the, the, the play on words and I, I see the acronym, so what is it? And I just wanna take a few moments to give us the quick and dirty of it because I know I'm gonna have your attention span maybe for a short amount of time. So I wanna give as much to you up front while you still kind of have uh, a little bit of interest in what I'm saying. And basically that acronym rehab is remember, exercise, hold, attack, be. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend the remainder of our time just quickly going through those words and what they mean and how you can apply that to your life. And so the reason why I chose rehab is because I felt like it fit how we can get out of the situations that we're faced with, that when you go into rehab, we kind of see it as a, a treatment for a number of different things, whether you get hurt, whether you get um, addicted to something, or whether you're just overwhelmed mentally or physically, you check yourself into this facility where you can get specific tailored treatment for the thing that you're going through. And so I just wanted to set our, our framework around that by giving us a working definition so that way we kind of understand where I'm coming from. And so rehab, if you don't already know, it just means the action, the process or result of restoring to a normal or it could be restoring to an improved condition of functioning. So basically it just means that you might have been hurt, you might have been set back, you might not be able to do the things that you normally were able to do. Uh, you might not be able to be that, that Michael Phelps swimmer, you might not be able to be that same bicyclist that you were when you were younger, but with a little bit of rehab, you can overcome um, your physical limitations to be either just back to that normal state or into an improved condition. And so that's what we're aiming for today, to get us past that overwhelming feel of failure, that overwhelming feeling of guilt, of that overwhelming fear of just paralysis of, I want to move forward, but it's just it's just not feeling right. And I don't know what to do in that season. So I just want to walk us through, hey, here's how we can get past that. And so we're going to delve in and, and look at each one of those particular parts of that acronym. So the first part of it is remember your faith. I, the reason why I start there is it's obvious. Um, as we've kind of heard, as we've been going through the Cash App series, it starts with the mindset. It starts with the mindset. It starts with the mindset. And so I echo that same sentiment that it starts with your mindset, that once you think it, then you can become it. And so I wanted us to understand that in order to get past the setback, to get past the fear that we're facing, that we need to be in a posture where we can actually have our mind in the right space, not, not when we're looking at okay, what's the latest and greatest that I need to get myself into, but what is it that I really need to put my faith in? And what do I need to set my mindset around so that my actions can follow it? Because ultimately we know that our actions are gonna follow that mindset. That's why we see a, a lot of men ending up on a lot of different situations. Crazy story that I just recently read was that of the Liberty University um, president of Jerry Falwell now having to resign because of extramarital activities. And we all, it's often for us, we have to understand, okay, where did this driver come from? How did we get to that situation where we find him in this situation where he now needs to step down from his position um, that he was blessed with? And it obviously started off with the mindset of, hey, I can do this and let's see how it results. And basically we see that through bad decisions, um, it wasn't necessarily one decision that got him there. It was a series of bad decisions that got him there. Almost like what we see with David and Bathsheba that, of course, he should have been out at war, but he was on his rooftop looking at, okay, she the baddest Joan out there. Let me see what I can do to make something happen. And I think we find ourselves getting into situations because we're like, okay, I want to do this, but is my mindset really in the right place to handle what I'm doing? 
And so we have to start with getting our mindset in place so that way we can move um, where God is calling us to go. And so I want to shift our, our focus to look at a verse. Um, this was pretty powerful because for me, this was a paradigm shift. Like this was something that I had been reading and reading and reading, and it really didn't kind of make sense to me. And so I'm going to just read it for you. And, and hopefully you guys can follow along with me. And that's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. So I'm going to be reading from what's the, what's called the net version or the new English translation. And you probably heard this verse before. Somebody quoted it um, either on Facebook, on your timeline, on your IG, or what have you. And, and basically what it says in, in Hebrews 11 is, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. And so for me, when I think about the definition of faith, it, it always, for me, kind of tied back into okay, if I'm reading this, it's something that I'm hoping for. Why isn't it happening? And so you see a lot of people kind of get frustrated by that, that whole faith movement of, I have faith that this thing is going to happen. Why is it not happening for me? Why is it not doing what I needed to do? Like I hoped for that man, or I hoped for that woman, or I hoped for that right relationship, or I hoped for that dollar amount of money, or I hoped for this thing to happen or that thing to happen. And then it didn't come to fruition. And then we're just like, okay, what, what God, like now I'm, I'm faithless. Like I've lost the faith that I have. And so for me, when I read it today, it, the words kind of leap off the page to kind of give context to this verse. So when we understand it, we're looking at the definition of a word. And so it says faith is being sure of what we hope for being convinced of what we do not see. So I want to break that down into parts. So it says, Faith is what we hope for. And what we have to understand is that we, for me, I was approaching this scripture, what, what I would call just a bias. And it was basically just what the shaman think, what the shaman see when he reads it. And a lot of times we enter into reading scripture from that same standpoint, which is shameless plug. Why we got to stop and just say, hey, God, just open up my eyes as I'm reading your word. Let me not have my own confirmation bias, not have my own subjective bias, but let me see it how you wanted it articulated. And so what we see is that it says what we hope for. And so the definition of faith is where are you placing your hope? It's not to say that the thing that you're after is wrong, it's where is your hope being placed? And so for you, when you read this passage of scripture, you have to understand the reason why that thing didn't come to fruition is because of where you put your hope. And so we displaced our hope to say, I'm hoping for this thing to happen. I'm hoping for this job to open up. And we know that when we put something else in the place of God, that nine times out of 10, it's not going to succeed in the long run. And so we have to now take a step back to say, okay, this is just giving me a plain definition to understand exactly what faith is. This is layman's terms. Or as one of my old preachers used to say, the grandmama cornbread version of this is just saying, hey, if you just want to understand generally what faith is, it's just saying you have hope in something. And so for us as believers, it says that we have to have our hope anchored in something, or I should say someone, uh, namely Jesus Christ. And that's where we now start to see the, the door unlock, so to speak, or that's where the aha moment comes into place to say, you know what? It's not just good enough to have faith, it's having faith in Jesus Christ. And that's ultimately how you get salvation, that it's not just saying, okay, I know who he is, I understand what he did. It's now saying, I am going to actually start to align things. I'm gonna align my actions, I'm gonna align activities to it. Um, sort of like what we're learning in Cash Apps of, hey, we now need to start aligning the things that we understand with the things that we need to do. Because to know something and to do something are two different things. Just because I know about the stock market or just because I know about options doesn't necessarily mean that I'm actually leveraging a portfolio with those things in it. Just because I know what a kid is doesn't mean that I know how to parent a kid. So just because we understand something or put our hope in something doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to come to fruition. It's what are we putting our hope and our understanding in. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of clarity on why we started out with just 
understanding or remembering what faith is because the faith that we have has to be placed into something in order for it to actually ignite or to erupt and to do what God called it to do. So continuing on, um, just a question for you guys. How do you feel when you're told have faith? I, I, I know anyone who's been around church, church folks for uh, a year, uh, probably even a month, has heard that term like, hey, brother, br sister, just go ahead and have faith. Just put your faith on it and God will make a way. And honestly, when you hear that term or when I hear that term, it definitely feels very disappointing. It feels saddening. And sometimes you feel angry. It's like you can't give me anything better. Like You probably should have just kept your mouth closed, to be honest. Um, but sometimes we just have to understand that, you know, not everyone is equipped to be able to handle those situations that we're faced. And so we have to understand that we have to anchor our faith in a Jesus who can help us pass what we're feeling. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, that when we're reading the verses, we have to put ourselves in a position that we're not approaching a situation with our own bias and say, you know what, I'm looking for it to go this way. I'm going to understand a scripture or how to apply it based on how I'm seeing it versus saying, you know what, I need to step outside of myself and remember that my faith is tied to Jesus Christ or that I need to put my faith in him so that I can unlock those many blessings that God has for me. All right, let's move to our, our very next part of it. So the first one is just remembering your faith. The next one is going to be exercise trust. So the reason why I want us to move into exercising trust or the reason why it kind of builds on that is because, again, once you understand it, it's time to do it. And basically, it kind of gives us that, that, that anecdote or just that idiom of put your money where your mouth is. That if you're saying, you know what, I'm going to step up and not only just understand it, but I'm actually going to put some action behind it. That's when you start to see things happen. And so for us to be able to get past the fear or the doubt or the rejection or that knockdown that we had, of, hey, I lost this job or hey, I lost this friendship that was really valuable to me or hey, I lost out on this opportunity or hey, I started and it just didn't go the way that I wanted to. It's time to say, you know what? I need to start creating a trust exercise of when a setback happens, what is going to be my reaction to the setback? And a lot of times the reason why we can't move forward is because we don't have wisdom or we don't have the guidance to be able to, to put our trust in the next thing of understanding that God is always working. As it tells us in Romans 8.28, that all things, not just the setbacks, not just the successes, but all of those things combined together work well for our good. So we have to start anchoring ourselves with wise counsel or with scripture to combat just what's going on in our head. Because nine times out of 10, that's where it's going to start. Of I'm going to be stressing out on my job about a report that I need to do that I know nothing about. True story, actually. Um, in the matter of, a, you know, a couple of hours, um, because I now have wisdom to move forward. And so for us, we have to be in a posture where, in essence, once you're faced with a difficult situation, you have to now take a step back and say, OK, what can I now put my weight on? Right now, I'm literally sitting in the chair. You probably can't see it, but there's definitely a chair here um, that in essence, once I put my weight on it, I'm trusting that it's going to hold me up. And sure enough, <laughs> it actually has been this entire time and it will um, for days and years to come because of how it's made and, and what um, durability it has. And the same for us, when we find ourselves facing difficult situations of being knocked down, what are we actually putting our weight on? Like, are we putting it on our savings account, which can be exhausted? Are we putting it into an ungodly relationship with someone who we know we shouldn't be in relationship with? Or are we putting it in this business deal that we know is probably not the right thing for us in this season? Are we looking at this job opportunity? So for us, we have to get in a posture of surrounding ourselves with wise and godly counsel to be able to trust him at his word to say, you know what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So even though I might fear speaking publicly, I know that God is going to give me the words to say in the moment that I need to say them. That when I need to step up and deliver something, God is going to make a way because he's told me in his word that he's never going to forsake the righteous, that his seed isn't going to be begging bread. So he's going to make sure that I'm set up for success. 
I just have to put my weight on it and to take the actions that he's called me to take so that I can actually move forward through it. So let's take some time to, to look at a couple of verses about how we exercise trust, how we put our weight on it, so to speak. And so the first passage of scripture that I want us to look at is going to be in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. And I'm going to be reading it from the New Living Translation. So in Proverbs chapter 9, it basically says, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. I'm going to read it again. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. And so when you read it, for me, it, it kind of took a little bit of time to, to comprehend what I was reading. Like the two scriptures just didn't seem to go together. And so I'm trying to tie this back into exercise, but I'm like, okay, God, ha, ha, help me make this thing work. Cause it's just, it's just not clicking for me. And basically what he's saying is in order to have trust in something, you have to understand what it is. And so when you read the first part of that scripture, it kind of throws you off because it's talking about respecting God, respecting him, and then you get the wisdom. But then you get down to the second part of that verse, and then it says, knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. So again, kind of backtracking, what you see is if you take that second part and just isolate it, it says, once you have knowledge of the Holy One, who is really Jesus Christ, understanding who he is and the work that he's done, then you now have good judgment. You now have a good understanding for right and wrong. And truthfully, on that day of judgment, you're going to have to account for what you did with your knowledge of the Holy One. In essence, you don't get condemned to hell because of your sins. You get condemned to hell because of your decision on what you did with the Holy One. Did you accept Jesus Christ? Or did you say, you know what? I heard about him, but he just wasn't for me. And so for us, we understand that we have to start off with a position of knowledge of being able to say, you know what, I understand it. Now let me put some action behind it. And then you see in the first part of that verse, it now makes sense that once I have the knowledge of who Jesus is, then I have a choice to make at that very moment. And it says fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. So fear just basically means that there's a relational status there. There's an understanding there. And basically, if you look it up in its root understanding it just means respect it means that you admire that you support that you submit to and basically it says that's where the fountain of wisdom comes in and if anyone understands a fountain it's something that continually gives off something you can look at a water fountain when you're back in elementary school for me i'm probably dating myself because um, that was one of the only ways that we could actually get water like there were no water bottles. There were none of those things. So we had to go to a fountain. And anytime we went, you turn the knob, the water came out. And so we understand that in essence, God operates the very same way that once we have that submission unto him, once we have that understanding and we're in a relationship, once we unlock him, in essence, everything starts to fall into place or the water start to gush out. Things start to happen where he's guiding decisions. He's making things successful for us. So if you're kind of paralyzed on, okay, how do I start to exercise trust? It's starting to say, I need to put my trust into the Holy One so that I can actually start to understand and unlock those things that he has for me. I want to move down to another passage of scripture. And this is found in Psalm and it's Psalm 56, 11. And I'm going to be reading. And again, forgive me, y'all. I, I, I got a whole bunch of different translations. So um, I just used a number of different translations because um, there are just some things that, that come across a little bit more clearly. Like for me, when I'm reading words, it helps me to unpack it or to understand what God is trying to speak a little bit clearer. And so the Christian Standard Bible for Psalm 56 kind of makes things a little bit clearer. And it says, basically, in God, I trust. In God, I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere humans do to me? And so for you, this is that exercise. This is that trust exercise and you're exercising of trust that you're saying, not only do I know God, but I'm actually going to put my faith in him. Because as we heard in Hebrews 11, 1, it's just saying that it's the substance of things hoped for. It's just saying that you have it, but what are you going to place it inside of? And so we have the culmination of that here in Psalm 56, where in verse 11, where it says, in God, I'm going to put my trust. And then from there, 
I now have a newfound confidence. I now have a newfound hope. I now have a newfound strength or grace, as we say in the church, that I now have a new strength to be able to move forward. And it says, once I put my faith in God, I don't have any reason to be afraid anymore because he's going to take care of me. Even in the most dire of situations, he's going to open up doors for me. I know for me, um, one of the situations that I faced was losing a scholarship. And it was just like, okay, now what's next, God? Like, I, I did everything that I was supposed to, but then I was like the prodigal son and I did everything that I wasn't supposed to. And it caused me to lose a scholarship. And it was just like, in that moment, I was like, man, like, okay, God, what next? Like, I, I no longer have this academia around me. So what do I have the opportunity to do? And for me, it was, it was really God just saying, I, I need you to understand yourself. Like, I need you to now start to take life seriously. Because up until that point, it was a game. Like, I, I was just like, okay, I can do this, I can do that, and I can get away with it. But God had to uncover some things and say, you know what, if you continue to do that, you're not going to realize that potential that you have. And so I really need you to be on your P's and Q's and do the work to put your trust in me that no matter the situations that you're going to face, let's not be irresponsible, but let's be responsible for what I've given you. And so God has given us a lot of different things for us to trust him in because he's trusted us with a lot of things. Um, one of the key things that I, I recently picked up is just understanding the relationship that Jesus had um, with, of course, the, the unprofitable disciple, um, the guy who was basically in charge of, of money, which was Judas. And so one of the powerful things that I saw about that is how Jesus knew about everything. Of course, he was God in, in human form, but the most powerful thing about that relationship was Judas was put in charge of the money. And when you start to do a study on Judas, you see that Judas was actually digging into the money and, and taking money for himself. So the things that were supposed to be used for ministry, the things that were supposed to be used to advance God's kingdom, he was actually taken and then spent it on his own desires, on his own things. And the crazy part about it is not one time do we see in scripture where Jesus was like, what our boss would be of, hey, I know you were responsible for this. I'm going to go ahead and give that to Tim because you're just not doing well with it. What God did was he extended his own trust and say, you know what, even though I've seen this person be irresponsible, even though I know this person is irresponsible, I am still going to trust that they are going to get it together. And so if God can still put his trust in you, knowing how irresponsible that you can be and how you have been, why can't you put your trust back into him? Because he's shown himself to be responsible, to be faithful. And so I just wanted to, to take us down that path just so that we have a better understanding of how we exercise trust. So let's move to the H. So we got the R, we got the E, we got the H. So basically the H is hold on to and hand out comfort. Um, the reason why I had both of those kind of juxtaposed together, it doesn't really make a bunch of sense, but it does is that there are things that we need to continue to hold on to until it's time for us to let it go. And so I, I kind of dropped in just an anecdote, like show me your hands. And the reason why I said show me your hands is because in essence, it helps to give credence or an understanding of what you value, of the things that you're putting your efforts into. If you're putting it all into your job, then you're in essence, neglecting your family responsibilities or you're re neglecting ministry responsibilities, whether that be personal ministry of there's some things that God wants to do through you. But in essence, you're holding your hands onto something that he said, I just need you to hold that for 10 seconds and then let it go. I just need you to hold that for a few hours and then let that go because I have something else that I need you to do. So again, show me your hands. Like, what are you doing with your hands? Because Ultimately, that's going to show what you're doing with what God is, is trusting you with. And then two, the next point is responsibility grows when you and I relinquish. So you're probably like, okay, what does that mean, Pastor Shimon? Like responsibility and growing and letting, like, help me make sense of that. And so the best way I can articulate that is you don't get to the next level until you release what you already are responsible for. And so one of the best things that, that I've kind of learned is, I can't necessarily hold on to an account manager position and move to the VP position. It just doesn't make sense. It's 
pretty much impossible. So in essence, in order for you to grow to where God needs you to go to or to be able to get out of feeling that knocked down of what do I do next? I have to release that, that fear or those past failures or those past setbacks. I have to say, you know what? In order for me to grow, to go to the next level, I now have to use my hands to push myself up. I need to now move out of what I'm facing and know that God is going to use that past setback or that past failure or that past breakdown to move me exactly to where I need to go. So you won't necessarily get to that next until you release where you're at now. So you just have to understand, I have to now do a paradigm shift to say, in order for me to get to that next level, I have to release the past or I have to release the position that I'm in. So that means you might have to now start to put in training. You might, you now need to start creating your transition plan or your business plan because you're now letting go of, hey, this position that I'm in is only temporary. It's now time for me to move on to the next. And let's go ahead and, and take a, a quick look at a couple of verses to help us understand this age of what I need to hold on to or what I need to release. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 5 through 7, and I'll probably read all the way down to, to verses 10. So I'm going to read 2 Corinthians this chapter 1, verses 5, and I'll, I'll go down to, to verse 10. And so in verse 5, it says, for the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. So here it is, period, point blank. If you're just like, man, why did this happen? I don't understand what was going on. Or even if you have questions, just go ahead and just start typing it up, send it to the chat host of like, man, I don't understand like why I had to go through this situation. Uh, verse five says, the more we suffer, the more God will shower us with his comfort. And what you have to understand is that, in essence, the trials, the troubles, the afflictions that you face are basically God's tools to be able to move you to that next. That, in essence, that next is to get the comfort that he has for you, because there's comfort in moving up. Yes, Lord, there is comfort in moving up. That once God elevates you to that next position, he's going to surround you with the comfort that you need to be able to walk and do the things that he's called you to do. So understand that in essence, it really isn't about you, that the suffering that you have to endure really is to obtain God's comfort and to also be a blessing. So let's keep reading so I can share that second part of how it becomes a blessing. So in verse six, it says, even when we were weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. So we already know again, we're going through these troubles because God is trying to get our attention. He's trying to wake us up to say, listen, I now need you to start taking some action. What are you holding on to? What do you need to let go of? Um, for when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. And so that just says that for thus, those of us who are Christians, the best thing that we can do is to understand that the troubles that we go through are for us to share. So all the difficulties that I've been facing personally of just the fears of the unknown, the fears of not doing. God is saying, listen, Shaman, I need you to share that there's something that I need you to do in this season. I need you to move past your fears. I need you to rehab yourself so that you can be in an approved position so that you can do great and mighty things for me. And the same for you that God wants you to utilize that comfort to understand that, listen, the setback happened. It is devastating. But at the same time, get up, you dry your tears, dust yourself off, whatever you got to do, but it's, it's now time to move forward because there's some comfort in moving forward. And so then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. So again, it's about enduring. And so in verse seven, it says, we are comforted, confident that as you share in our sufferings, that's the troubles that you go through, the things that you're faced with, you will also share in the comfort that God gives. So if there is nothing else that you took away from today, hopefully you understand that, again, there's some things that you have to hold on to, and then there's some things that you have to let go of so that you can get to your next. And just understanding that once you start to let go, like I know it, it pains you or that you wanna hold on to it because it feels like it's the only thing that's keeping you alive. God is saying, listen, will you trust me? This is a season where I need you to endure this trust, this suffering by trusting me that I am going to provide for you. That if you step out on faith and say, you know what, I'm going to actually start tithing. Or if you step out in faith and say, hey, you know what, I'm actually going to put out my, my next chapter 
you know, for my publicist in the next month, or I'm actually going to start reaching out to a couple of people to build up my network so that I can actually start to do that consulting thing that I'm talking about. Or, you know, I need to shine up my resume because you know what, even though I might not have the credentials, God is saying that if I put it out there, there's going to be an opportunity for me. And so right now is that time where you can actually start to get comfort in knowing that God is going to comfort you and that he's going to surround you with the things that you need so that you can move forward. So in verses eight and nine, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. So basically, again, kind of set in the context. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. So obviously, Paul is just kind of laying it all out there for us. Like, listen, I was going through a situation where it, it was life threatening. And I'm sure in some situations we're faced with the same thing, that there's a life threatening situation that we're going through right now, that if we don't make the right choice, we might feel overwhelmed. But Paul is kind of giving us a good illustration that even though it might feel like it's life threatening, there's still some hope that we can still put our hope in the one, in the Holy One. And he says in verse nine, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on who? We stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. And the reason why that those last four words are powerful is because it shows just the authority of God that no matter what situation you're faced with, whether it is a dead situation, something that's beyond recoverable, something that's beyond repair, that you can still rely on God because he's able to raise up something that's beyond recoverable, that's something dead, something no longer working, something that might have happened and it's now uh, basically stopped. He's now saying that I serve a God that once I put my faith in him, that he'll even move in that situation, that dead situation. So if you're faced with a dead situation, know that God can still do mighty things even in that dead situation or that circumstance. So you just have to trust and actually start to make those moves. You need to start aligning your actions, learn what to hold on to and what you need to let go of in this season for yourself. And then in verse 10 to wrap it up, Paul just kind of gives us just that consolation to say that, and he did rescue us from mortal danger. So if we look back, we see that they expected to die in verse nine. He was like, man, this is all, this is a wrap. Basically, this is a wrap. We, we're not gonna make it out of here. But you see in verse 10, here's the hope, here's the comfort for you that he rescued them from mortal danger and he'll rescue us again. So no matter if you find yourself in another dangerous situation or another dead situation, know that you hope in a omnipotent God, a God that's all powerful, that can do exceedingly abundantly above everything that you could ask or think that that same God is more than willing to step in and rescue you out of that dead situation or that next 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 dead. So hopefully you get it like that next situation, no matter how dire it is, God is able to raise you up and to rescue you from out of that situation. So that's why you can put your confidence in him and he'll continue to rescue you in those situations. So let's move forward. Um, next part of that is, of course, we got to remember we got the E, which is the exercise. We got the H of what we need to hold on to or, or what do we need to, in essence, hand out what we need to let go of. Now we're at the A, which is attack your fears. Here it is. Like, I am tired of us always being passive in the things that we do, us being Christians, that we're supposed to turn the other cheek. No, God has given us a mighty sword. When, when you read the Bible, it talks about the Bible being a sword. It says that the sword is living and powerful and sharper, um, that the scriptures that we have can actually help to bring about knowing situations, wisdom, to be able to attack things that we need to. And so I want you to understand that you start to attack your fears by the things that you're putting in. And again, it has to be anchored in your trust in Christ and what your wisdom looks like. Is your wisdom coming from God? And so again, Attacking the fears just means that you're going to take some aggressive actions um, with weapons. Again, the Bible is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon. Fasting is a weapon. And in, in order to be able to fight the battles that you need to, you have to understand what are the weapons at your disposal. Like for me, I think about just John Wick. In, in, in essence, like I, I don't know if you guys seen the movie or know about it, but just backstory there. John Wick is basically an assassin. 
And in essence, he he now has a bouncy on his head and he now has to, in essence, fight his way out of it by, uh, in essence, taking out as many people as he can in order to bring about truth in a situation. And so he has a choice of the weapons at his disposal. And for him, he chooses the ones that are fit for him. He doesn't choose every last gun and say, hey, just pack them all up. He says, no, I have to choose the ones that are right for me for the season that I'm in to be able to attack the people that I need to in the way that I'm built, in the way that I'm structured. So for you, you have to be able to understand what are your most powerful weapons. Your most powerful weapon might be fasting. You might not want to, but for you, if you start to fast, that's when God starts to speak to you and move in your life in the biggest and most powerful way. For others, it might just be, you know what? I need to step up my prayer life. Like that prayer, that connection that I have with God might be my biggest and my strongest weapon. So I now need to employ that a little bit more. Or it just might just be the memorization and the usage of scripture, just having the word at your disposal to be able to speak to situations that you're faced with, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that I am the head, I'm not the tail, that I am a blessing and not a curse. So just having an understanding of what are the tools that are around, but knowing which tools you need to leverage most. Like in basketball, what you'll understand is that players have certain moves that they use. They don't necessarily steal and use every last move they use the ones that are the best fit for them so when you look at a lebron he understands that his best weapon is to be a facilitator that when he's on the court as long as he's able to get people in the right positions and move the ball to where it needs to go that's the best weaponry for you know their offense to be able to attack a defense so you just need to understand okay what are my best weapons what do i now need to employ the best to be able to accomplish what i need to um, and then the second part is, where's the love? And the reason why I put that there is we're going to look at a scripture. And the reason why I have that is because love is one of the best weapons that we have in order to combat our fears. And so with that being said, I, I want us to take a look at a couple of verses. So the very first one that I want us to look at is going to be in Proverbs 24, chapter 24 verse 6 so proverbs 24 verse 6 i'm gonna be reading from the new living translation why can't i get these verses together all right y'all bear with me for a second uh, proverbs 24 verse 6 new living translation so it says so don't go to war without wise guidance victory depends on having many advisors and the reason why i highlighted it in yellow is because it gives you clear guidance like you can go to war if you want to um, but the outcome is probably not going to be what you hope or anticipate it to be. So just understand that, in essence, we're in a battle. That's why I said you have to attack your fears. You're in a battle of the things that you face in your mind, the things that you face in this world from a physical standpoint of how I'm going to make ends meet. How am I going to get to the next? How am I going to make this thing happen? You know, whatever it is that you're faced with, there is a battle that's going on. But in essence, there's also a spiritual battle that we can't be ignorant of, that we can't just say, oh, yeah, that's that's what you Christians talk about. Those Pentecostal fire baptized, clapping, tambourine dancing. Oh, no, like we're legitimately, legitimately. And with as much uh, force that I can say this, we're in a spiritual battle day in and day out. Um, that's why when you read in the Lord's Prayer, it says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like there are things that are happening in heaven that manifest itself here on earth and things that we do here on earth that in essence have impacts from a heavenly or a spiritual standpoint. So in essence, we have to understand that when we're attacking our fears, we have to now have things in place to properly fight those battles. And it says that you don't go to war, you don't go to battle without getting wise guidance. And so you wanna make sure that when you're fighting your battles, you have appropriate guidance. Wise guidance is gonna come by word of the man of God or the woman of God in your life. It's gonna be by someone who's a little bit further in you that, hey, if you wanna be able to start your new business or you wanna be able to get to that next opportunity or you wanna be a consultant or you wanna get into a certain field, the way you do that is very easy. Like you have a lot of tools at your disposal by way of resources around you, by way of books, by way of people, where you can just delve in and move forward with wise guidance. And then it says at the end that whether you're successful or not is going to depend on how much advice did you get to go to battle. So in essence, if you're not as successful as you want to be, 
it might be I need to add in another person into my my board of directors or my personal board of directors or my advisement group or whoever I listen to to be able to get counsel from. I might need to expand that just a little bit more because I can't just seem to make it past that situation. Like I thought I had this parenting thing down, but then they got to age eight and five. And these emotions are just killing me, true story. <laughs> um, so how do I now manage in that situation of now that I have an eight and a five-year-old, how do I father them differently? Who can I talk to to be able to get tools on how to manage their emotional well-being so that I'm not just going off the handle or I'm not just not giving them the love or the attention that they need or being apologetic for the things that I've done. Like, how do I now navigate that? And so my victory as being a father that leaves a legacy to my kids, a positive one of, yeah, I remember my dad did this and those are things that I want to emulate. I want to leave that legacy or that victory within my children so that they can also pass those on to their children and other people that they come into contact with. So that's why I wanted us to look at that. And then secondly, going back to that, where is the love? Here it is right here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. And I'm going to read it from the New International Version. So in 1 John chapter 4, it says, there is no fear in love. Boom. Mic drop. If there's nothing else, again, no fear in love. So again, one of your, your biggest assets or one of your biggest weapons that you have at your disposal is understanding, okay, am I putting love in this situation? That even though it might be disturbing, even though it might be a distraught, like what love am I displaying in this situation that, hey, it's a situation that I found myself in that I don't know how I'm going to get out of. Like one of the stories that immediately comes to mind is that of Joe of, hey, I was living life, doing my thing. And then all of a sudden everything started to happen. I lost my kids. I lost my cattle. I lost my resources. I lost the respect of my wife. And through it all, Job still kept the love in place. And that love that I'm talking about was just the love in God, his faith in God to say, you know what? Even though I, I, I might've lost this, I might've lost that, I might not have this, I might've wanted to do that, but I no longer can. He still had a love and a fervor for God that he wasn't gonna disrespect God because his wife said, hey, you, you had a good life, honey, but this God that you've been serving, you might as well just go ahead and curse him and die. He was just like, no, I'm not. Like, naked as I came into the world, naked as I'm going to go, but I'm going to praise God. And so for us, we have to have that love for God, that trust in God, that even though the situation might be dire, like what Paul faced or what Job faced, that God is going to reign in your hearts and in your minds. He's going to give you that comfort. He's going to give you that love, but you have to have it resident in yourself. You have to take it. That's something that you have to hold on to. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling distraught and you got that knocked down, this is where you now lean in and hold on to that love that God has and reflect that love that you, you're getting. Like, again, as Paul said, as you're being comforted, you might as well share that comfort. And that's why we have joy because we've seen like even though that situation was dying, where they were facing death, that they thought they were going to die, God rescued them out of it. That even though, you know what, this bill is coming due, or my car is about near to go back, or this student loan is about to default, I still need to hold on to my faith and my trust in God that even if that situation does happen, I know that God can still work it out. That he can still change the trajectory of my life, even though I might have fallen back, even though I might not have everything that I want, even if it's dead. God can still rescue me and raise me up out of a dead situation. So just understand that having that love for God is going to get you past that fearful situation. And then it says perfect love drives it out. So again, once you start to pull in that love, it starts to drive out the fear that you're facing. And again, fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So just understand that once you hold on to that love, you start to utilize that love and start to share it, you'll start to see that the fear, the hesitation, whatever you were faced with, the stress, the, the anxiety, the worry, whatever it was, it starts to get pushed out. And if you need to, you can, that's a shameless plug again, that you can tap into resources. There are people, there are medical practitioners 
that specialize in helping to overcome just the worry, the anxiety, the fear that you might be facing, the phobia that you might have um, with a person or with a thing or with an activity that there are people that can help you in this rehab journey that you're on to be able to get back to a normal or even an improved condition of functioning. Amen. All right, so let's go on to our very last one. So we got the R, the E, the H, the A, and now we're at B. And literally B means just be. Again, be yourself, be who God created you to be. And that's one of the things that for me, I had the longest time coming to terms with because I just never felt like I was enough. Just a lot of life situations of just being you know, homeless, Proto homeless is probably the better term to use because in essence, I wasn't staying with family, but I was couch surfing with friends and with neighbors. So for a season of life, I, I just didn't feel like any situation that I was in would lead to a productive ending. Because again, going back to my childhood of seeing my parents divorce and then seeing just bad relationships happen all around me of losing friendships and just not having things. I just felt like if I entered into a situation, there was always a dark cloud that was also coming along with me in that situation. So I had a hard time really embracing, OK, Shaman, like you bring value, that you are a good thing, no matter how you might be feeling, no matter what the history of a situation might bring to you, that I had to start to embrace who I was, this tall six foot six guy with these long feet, like I'd now embrace every inch of my being. And so um, in that, I now have confidence. I now have love for myself and that I exude that um, when I'm talking with others, that I want them to feel the same thing that I feel on the inside because I now accept and love myself. And it only came through just the affirmations of God and through friends, um, people that he surrounded me with to say, you know what, you are um, someone of value. You are someone of esteem, someone of respect, someone who I enjoy spending time with. And so for you, if you're feeling that same way, just know that you are someone of value, that you are someone who's deserving of love, who's deserving of the very best that God has for you. And even though the situations and the past that you feel um, that you've endured might not feel like the love that you need to be, just embrace that you are great, that you are beautiful, that you are loving, that you are who God called you to be. So just embrace who you are, be who God created you to be. And in order to do that, just some tangible, practical things that I, I just wanna challenge you to do. Um, just jot down words or thoughts. Like you don't have to sit down in front of the computer and just be like, um, I do this and I do that. Like it just might be opening up a text and sending a text to yourself. Sometimes you just gotta encourage yourself. Like if there's something that you read or something that you hear that resonates with you, like just jot it down and send it to yourself. I, I'm guilty of that all the time. Like one of the things that, that resonates with me now, um, of course, just the backdrop of Kobe Bryant passing away, we're now celebrating his birthday and mama day, just the whole 824 activities. And so Nike put a, a video out and one of the parts, it was a Kobe clip where it just says, do the simple things right. And so for me, that's something that I, I now take the heart of you know, there are a lot of things that I want to do, but am I really making the base thing, the, the you know, the real thing? And so for me, I now challenge myself or will continue to challenge myself. Like, am I doing the simple things right? Because you want to do greatness like Kobe. You want to achieve greatness. You want to win championships and you want to get to certain places. But you can't necessarily get to greatness unless you're doing the simple things right. So, again, just jot down words, ideas, phrases, things that you hear to be able to start to speak to yourself so that way you can be who God created you to be. And then next, as I've already kind of articulated, talk to wise people. Again, as we saw in Psalm, I mean, Proverbs 24, 6, they didn't go to war. You shouldn't go to war without wise counsel, without wise advice. So it might be, hey, I know I usually go to mom, but mom might not be the wisest counsel in this situation. I might need to go to dad, who I really don't have a great relationship with, but just seems to be keen in on how I move and how I act and how I am. So you just have to understand how God is leading you, who he's asking you to talk to, what you need to consult um, from a wise counsel insight so that you have insight on yourself. And then next is just, once you have it, it's time to share it. Like share how God has created you. And so what that just means is in a number of different ways that it can happen both physically and intangibly that however God has gifted you, if your gift is writing and you know what, I, I just need to step up and start to start blogging or I need to start putting out content that God is revealing to me as I'm going through devotions, 
hey, what better opportunity than to reach out to Pastor Jason or myself and say, hey, if you if you don't mind, like I would love to just add in certain things at the end of our newsletter or, hey, I might want to help with editing the newsletter because I just have an eye for those things. So however God wired you like it, there's a number of different people, Preston, Cedric, who provide a number of different things just based on how they're wired. Like Cedric does it through music. Preston does it through production, just his eye on how you see certain things and how he's able to tie those together. Um, just understand, like, use that wise counsel or just how you're wired to be able to share your gift to the world. So that way you can be and accomplish that potential that God has put inside of you so that you start to realize exactly what it is. And so I've got a couple of verses and then we'll be done. So again, if you got questions, make sure you just start sending them into the chat as we, we start to get through the end of this. And we're definitely going to take some time for questions because I, I feel like I've gone through just this whole rehab, but I would love to hear some of the questions that you guys have. So um, let's go back to our verse. So in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. And so basically that means that this is the highest level quality of work that God couldn't have done it any better. So replace the we with you. So whoever you are, just put your name in that sentence to say for Shaman is, for Tamika is, for Cedric is, for Preston and Rashida, whoever you are, you put yourself in there. Just say, for I am God's masterpiece. He created me anew in Christ Jesus so that I can do the things he planned for me long ago. And so just understand that God always has a plan, that he specifically had a plan for you, he had a plan for your life, and he was intentional in the way that things happened, both good and bad, or if it was just all bad, he had a plan for all of that bad to round it out for something good. So just understand that even though you might be face, facing uh, a death type of situation, you might be facing the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship. And you're like, man, like, I, I don't feel like God's masterpiece. Just know that this verse is your encouragement. It's something that you might need to text yourself, that you tell yourself over and over and over that I am God's masterpiece, that I am something special, that I am a work of art, that he planned some good things for me to do. And so I need to make sure that I understand that because I'm a masterpiece, there's some things that I need to show off, so to speak. Let's look at the next one and then we'll be done. So Philippians chapter one, verse six, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So again, I just wanna encourage you more and more and more that again, you can overcome your fears by that last word, be, just be who you are. Like, I think a lot of times, and again, I'm guilty of it just on the way that I laid this out, that we always gotta do, 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 which is good, but it needs to be complemented with times of just being. Like we, we know in the verse that it tells us, be still in Psalm, be still and know that I am God. So sometimes it just might be, I just need to be for a while. I just need to sit back and just take an inventory that I need to meditate and assess um, some scripture and how I apply it to my life before I try to do. So if you're in that state where you're always do, 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 um, it might just be a, a season of right now. I just need to be who God created me to be that understanding that God is going to cre do that good work that I might be pushing so hard, but it might be a, a time to let up off the gas to, to tap the brake for a second and say, you know what? God is going to complete that work, no matter how dead it is, no matter how not down I might feel, no matter how scared I might feel, that I might just need to take a step back for a second. But at the same time, understand that Christ is going to continue that work until the day of completion. So I just wanted to leave you guys with that. Um, hopefully you all were encouraged. Hopefully it changed you. For anyone who might have joined us today and this might be your first time or you just might not even know all that was going on, you might just say, hey, I just need to tune in the Bible study. Like truly this was a, a labor of love to connect you to Christ at a deeper level. So if you don't know Christ, this is the opportunity for you to do so. And uh, what I want you to do is um, text WBVIP to 51555 or hop on our website which is Zion Woodbridge forward slash connect or zionwoodbridge.com forward slash connect um, and just fill out our connect card or you can even hop on Facebook Messenger. I know a lot of you guys are probably watching me on Facebook Messenger right now um, or I should say Facebook, the platform. Open up the Facebook Messenger app or utilize the Messenger and send a quick message to our Zion Woodbridge 
Messenger, and we'll get back to you ASAP. So this is just an opportunity for us to share Christ with you or to get you connected to our church if you want to get in at a deeper level. Maybe you might have been challenged to say, you know what? I now need to attack my fears by doing something that I was scared to do. And so this might be your opportunity to say, you know what, I need to join a life group or, hey, it's my season to serve. And so this is your opportunity in the here and now to say, it's time for me to jump in and attack my fears by doing something for God. Um, or if this is your season to be, um, I would hope that you would be in proper relationship with him first and foremost. So again, those same rules still apply. So if you text WBVIP to 51555 or if you reach out, zionwoodbridge.com forward slash connect, we'll definitely get you connected. So with that being said, I am going to take a pause and I am going to start to look at the questions to see what we got. So one of the questions that we, we have is using therapy to help with rehab. <laughs> um, I, I would say, I, I think that's, that's abundantly clear that again, for me, God created what we have here, um, that we get to see his work, his handiwork through professionalism, through people who have studied, who have endured <laughs> uh, by way of graduate school or even you know, doctorate school to be able to obtain a degree on how to clinically diagnose and to handle a situation that you're faced with. So I would say, um, again, to tie those two together, if, if yours is, hey, I need to remember to, to check in with my therapist, go ahead and do that. Or if it's, I don't have a therapist, this might be your time to now have that memory jog to move to the E of, I now need to exercise trust by reaching out to a therapist to set that appointment up so that way you can get the healing. Or it might be, I now need to hold on close to my therapist because I'm going through something so badly that I, I really need my therapist to really speak to me. And that might be that wise counsel that you need. Or again, attacking, um, reaching out, just getting the help that you need by way of therapy. So I, I would say those are definitely complementary with one another. Next question that, that we had come in, how do I know if my idea comes from God or just myself? So here's, here's a, 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 good, a good indicator of that. Um, the idea in and of itself, you have to measure what is it accomplishing? So for me, I always begin, like there's a statement, begin with the end in mind, begin with the end in mind. And so what I mean by that is, what is the result of the idea that you have? Like, is the result to bring glory to yourself? Is it to accomplish what you need to accomplish? Is it self-driven where, hey, once I do this thing with the idea, the glory now comes back to me, or is the idea to open it up, to be able to be a blessing to others, that this idea is basically going to be shared with the world to help them with situations or to fix a problem that they may be facing. Again, um, just because an idea doesn't necessarily have a chiefly Christian connotation to it, um, and I'll give an example for that. So for example, if your idea, right, is to create a a, a sink unclogger, that is something that can be used to bring glory to God because it's solving a problem. It's reducing frustration for people. And thank God we got Drano for our sinks because a lot of us would be upset to have to pay a plumber hundreds of dollars. Like this is an easy fix. So if you have something that's an easy fix, that's still just as good as um, being on a platform like this to be a minister of the gospel, um, to share the word with Christ. But at the same time, if you do get the platform, like when you get the opportunity to get interviewed, just say, hey, this idea came from God. Like it wasn't me. This was just to solve a problem that I feel like a lot of people are facing. And this was something that God gave to me to inspire me to help the world. Like I just wanted to do my part. And that's what God is looking for. Like um, one of the athletes that I admire most is, is Steph Curry because he uses his platform often and regularly to share Christ. Like he, he doesn't say like, hey, you know, I'm thankful for, you know, just the opportunity to be here. Like he's unapologetic about Jesus Christ source and anchor whenever he gets interviewed. So he uses his platform, which is as an, a pro and NBA athlete to be able to say, you know what, 
I'm here because of the grace of God, because I'm gifted in this way. It's ultimately to bring glory to God and how he makes us, how he's created us, how he's wired us. Like he just so happened to wire me to be athletically gifted. He might have wired another person to be musically gifted. He might have wired another person to be uh, a writer and gifted in that manner. So we just all have gifts. But at the end of the day, you'll know the difference through the litmus test of what is the end brain? Like, are you willing to give God the glory once that thing comes to fruition? Or is it more, hey, this 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 idea is to, to get me a whole bunch of uh, chips? Uh, good question, though. So for me, um, the question came in, what do you fear most, Pastor Shaman, and how do you combat it? So for me, um, going back to what I mentioned earlier, the thing that I fear most is at, at its most simplest point is probably going to be um, failure. Um, for me, the thing that really kind of challenges me is, am I failing? Because again, I kind of go to that backdrop of the situations that I faced in life. Like, will life be cyclical where I go back to what I started as? If having divorce happen again or losing key relationships with my kids or losing intimacy with my wife. So for me, it's the fear of, of losing out on the things that I get to enjoy now. So it's, hey, the potential, like that, that bad space of, am I going to lose out on something that hasn't happened? And so for me, I always fear not actualizing the potential that's, that's set out before me. Like, for me, I always, again, do the simple things right. Like I always want to make sure that I'm emptying out everything that God gave to me because the last thing I would want is to have an idea, a word, an encouragement, something that God gave to me for someone else and I die with that very same thing. And so for me, the thing I fear most is not realizing the potential or not leveraging everything that God put in me. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm empty in, in every form and, and love and comfort and encouragement and peace and whatever God has put in me. I just want to make sure that I'm pouring out as quickly and as soon as possible with, with anyone I get the opportunity to do. Next question. Can you explain your usage of multiple Bible versions tonight? Is Christian standard a paraphrased version? So <clears throat> just to give context to why I use so many different versions tonight, uh, the reason I use a lot of different versions is because of the wording of it. Like um, when you look at the Bible in its original intent, words mean different things. And so when I'm reading scripture to audiences, the best way to articulate something is to give a word or a wording of something in a way where it makes the most sense to the audience. So for me, I would say personally, my favorite translation by and large, hands down, is gonna be New King James Version. But within our, our church construct, one of the things that's easy for the audience, for the at-large group, is going to be the New Living Translation because it's comprehensible, it's concise. And so for me, when I read, um, in particular, the Christian Standard Version, it was just the wording of that particular passage. And it was more palatable, I believe, for just the audience at large. So for anyone who wants to go deep into Bible study, just understand on the back end. So this is kind of for people who are thinking about, hey, I want to go into vocational ministry. Like I want to do what Pastor Jason does, or I want to do what Pastor Shaman does, or one of our ministers. I want to do what one of those, uh, in essence, positions do. And so if you're looking at going into that direction, what I would challenge you to do is understand that what we have are translations. And the best way to understand the Bible is by reading it in its original manuscript, which is understanding that the New Testament was written in Greek. And so what we have are translations. So there were scholarly, um, I would say input, scholarly, uh, not even the word input, because that's probably the wrong word to use, but there was scholarly interpretation of how scripture was written and what it meant. So in essence, when you read a translation, it's just saying that, hey, here's how it was written, and here is how I translate it. Sort of like what we get English language versus French or English language versus Spanish. So we just have a translation of a word. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the exact word, which is why I said if you want to go deeper, you, you need to understand it in, a, in its original context, which is, again, Greek for New Testament, Hebrew for the Old Testament. And the way that you get to that original context 
is by going into um, getting a concordance. And basically a concordance gives you a verbatim, hey, here is what this word meant. Here's how you understand the usage of the word. So that way when you read it, you're reading it in the way the author conveyed it, not in the way you want to understand it. That's why I had to really start us off with just Hebrews 11, just understanding like for me personally, I've been reading it wrong my whole life because I was I was hoping again, as it says in that verse, like the substance of things hoped for. I was like, OK, God, if you tell people this is what faith is, why do we get disappointment and why do we feel bad when someone tells us to have faith? And it's basically just saying, Shaman, you've been reading that wrong your entire life. It's not saying faith is that something good is always going to happen. It's saying, no, faith in and of itself is just having a trust in something. So for us, again, I know I gave a, a long dissertation on that. Um, translations just mean that it's a, a, a one off from the original, but it's helping you to understand what the original was trying to convey. And so I read the Christian Standard Version because I felt like it would be the most palatable for the audience. The New Living Translation just gave a different wording that I just didn't feel like it would hit the way that I wanted it to. So that was the only reason why I used it. But good question, though. Um, any more before we go? I'm going to just check, make sure nothing came in by way of text or anything like that because my phone been blowing up. All right. So with that being said, if, if that's all we got, that's all we're going to do. Um, thank y'all for hanging in for this time. I hope this that you enjoyed it. Again, the, the material that I put together tonight, if you want it, just email me. You can reach me at smalls, S-S-M-A-L-L-S at zionchurch.org. Y'all can drop that in the chat. Um, if you want this just to refer back to or just to have it in your notes to just hey, this will help me when I'm facing a fearful situation. This will help me when I feel like I'm knocked down. Like, just understand, like, rehab works um, when you employ it. So for me, if, if you want it, just email me, text me, whatever you need to do, IG me, Facebook, and this, this presentation is your, yours, along with personal commentary. If you want to just, hey, what did you mean by this? Or you wanted to know more, I'm more than willing to share what I got because I, I, I want us all to grow in this together. Amen. So let me go ahead and, and pray us out. Thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the love that you have for us. But well, most importantly, letting us know that even when we're in a death situation, even when we're in the ultimate ending of a situation, we're still not too far from you reviving or stepping in to change what we're faced with. So I pray that you would raise us up to have confidence, not in things, not in people, but ultimately in you, God, as you say in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all your righteousness. Everything that you've called right, that's what we should be doing. That's what we should be seeking after. That's what we should be making first, that you'll add everything else, that you'll make everything else that we desire, that we want fall into place, God. So I pray that that would be our heart's desire, that we seek you, we trust you, we put our faith in you, that we hold on to you. We attack the things that you've called us to but most importantly, that we just be who you've called us to be. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. I give you thanks, Dad. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. Y'all take care, and we will talk soon. That's it.